so this is not uh, a long talk. It is not a technical talk. Uh, and it also can be more of a discussion uh, than a talk. It, let me start out with a premise that back in the day, uh, which is so recent that we probably all remember it, there was sort of a, a code of ethics about how servers that broadcast data work, if, especially if they are servers that aggregate data from like all over the web or from specific data sources, and then they're just supposed to publish them out. Google would be the classic example, right? It crawls the entire web, it treats every website that it can read as a data source, unless robots.txt you know, file says not to do that. Uh, and then it puts it all in the search index, and then you do a search for something. And uh, when you do the search, it grabs results in the index and it shows you little snippets. And there was almost this ethical imperative. Um, I mean, you can see it in, in Google's um, uh, IPO filing, and you can see it in their public statements that they were not going to censor anything. They were not going to, you know, remove data unless by court order or there was some overriding, uh, you know, need to do so. And the deal was that if you wanted something, if there was something about you on Google that you didn't like, well, first of all, if it was on a server you controlled, your, your responsibility was to take it down from that server, and then like there were ways you could tell Google that that it was gone, and then they might re-index re that page <coughs> or that site. Or if it was on some other site, what Google really wanted you to do, and I'm using Google as a standard for any, any search engine company here, is go to that other site and make a complaint to them, and then when it was gone from the source site, Google would take it, you know, it would come out of their index either naturally or they would do it uh, through some special request process. So the idea was stuff is out there. It's not our responsibility that stuff is out there, but we're going to tell you what's out there. And if you don't like what's out there, it's your responsibility to get the a source one degree farther back than us to take it down. Um, this has really started to change gradually over the years. And what's most, most interesting to me is that the the sort of feeling of it is our job to, to preserve the data and broadcast the data among techies has started to change. So the way I got uh, into giving this talk was, it still works, that's amazing, um, <laughs> that I got an email, I think this original one was, Derek, you were yeah. forwarding it, right? I've, I've, so in the interest of not rebroadcasting things that I'm talking about, not rebroadcasting, I've eliminated the names, <laughs> and all the URLs are faked in here. Um, so this person, uh, sent a mail to, I guess, the webmaster of Councilmatic saying, please remove my name and any claims and or new, I think that was meant to say news, and related materials to my name from your website. Thanks. Well, what was the material in question? There was, there was a specific URL associated with this request. Uh, it, what was it? An, uh, a water rate? Yeah. Rec, like a water you know, reconsideration exemption. Yeah. exemption or something? Basically, this person had themselves gone before a public body of the city, right, and argued into where someone was taking notes that were going to be part of the public record forever and ever, that something about their water rate needed to be changed. Um, and then when that showed up on a public website and then got reflected on Council Medic, the person complained to Council Medic. Um, so Derek and, uh, who was it originally? It was, um, that wasn't Steve, Steve no, Vance. That wasn't because there were two examples, right? I can remember which one. So we talk about it, and I think, what did you decide to do? You, I think maybe you have it here. Uh, I don't have what you did here, but that's, by the way, that's, that's the way I've greened out the name person, but you know, there was a name right there, excessive water rate claim for so-and-so. Um, you decided to take it down? Yes. Um, and what was, what was your reason? I'm just asking you so I can get a drink of water. I really care about you. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it'd be better to not have people upset at me. <laughs> <laughs> so when I come to the end of this presentation and there's the part about, you know, what are some working principles we can use, I will remember to add that in the next version of the slides. Well, Don't want people upset at you. I haven't actually removed the name yet. I know, I checked I can't it. I it from coming back because it scrapes from another site and the other site ah. does not remove the data. Ah, so, so you can remove the name from your database, but your scraper will automatically re-get it. Now, uh, you know, obviously you wrote your scraper, right? Or you, you control your data. You can do anything you want. Yeah. So you just have to write some, I think you said in your reply to the person, I remember again, I, said, I, to I have to write some code to yeah. do this. And you know, that was in what, 2010 or 2011. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you'll get around to it. So, <laughs> let's make fun of Stephen Knight. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's still there, except that there's green smudge in front of it in my slides. Um, 
And then, uh, <laughs> I, you don't have to read this whole thing, but it's a pseudonym. Jane von Dulzeit Pfeiffersdorf has emailed me asking for her name to be removed. So this, this example is, is more subtle and more, more challenging. So in the original one, I thought Stephen was being generous for removing the person's name, because after all, they went before a public body, you know, they made this excessive water rate claim, and now their name was showing up in the public records. And Councilmatic is just another reflection of public records. I don't think you can expunge it from the city's records, right? Like, it's going to keep. Water there would be the original one that's excessive water rate. No, it's in yeah. the journal council of proceedings. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in the, the like the notes, you know, from a like city council. So, but this one is different. This uh, person is asking to be removed from the Chicago cityscape site uh, because. Well, for one thing, she says, I, quote, didn't give my permission for my name to be listed there, which is a really complicated question, when you need permission for your name to be used to be associated with something or not. There's like a whole body of trademark law and libel law and all this stuff, you know, and, and, and use of likeness and things. Um, but the other reason is that she's not the person who represents building permits at her company. And if you go to the URL, which, by the way, is fake, so don't even try it. Um, <laughs> Uh, there they are, um, you know, hot water heater replacements, building info in the next, if you scroll that page down, there's the building and there are some grayed out names. The, that graying out is just an artifact of the website. You, you can actually view those names. So the name really is there. You just have to like, you can view source, you can, you know, highlight over that text and you'll see the names. They are there. Um, so this person is saying, I, it shouldn't have been my name in the first place and somewhere there is a there is a record that is wrong. What happened was her company does some kind of contracting or building maintenance. The city, which department, the building permits department, whatever hands those out, got from the company the wrong name of the person at the company who is supposed to handle mm -hmm. permits, and now that name is up there. So the name is in the city data. It's part of the public mm -hmm. record, but the person is saying it's wrong. So what is your responsibility as the the owner of a reflecting server, rebroadcasting server, should you should you faithfully reflect errors in the public record? Should you annotate them? Should you keep the error but then annotate it, saying this person claims it's not a real name? So, you know, add more information. The answer, you know, is not suppressing speech, but more speech. Or should you just delete it? Should you delete it and replace it with a note saying you have deleted it and why and how much work are you prepared to go through to do all this? Right? There's a lot of questions. Um, I think the answer. That Steve, I think this is your mail, actually, right? Yes. Um, you you told the person the data comes from the city. That's where the mistake comes from. So you tell the user it's not your fault. Very good. Um, <laughs> we we don't. I thought this was a good solution. We don't want to continue spreading the mistake. So we will remove your name from this and from four other records in which your name appears. That was very generous. Of course, if you got slammed with requests like this, you'd have to have a whole department to handle them. Because <laughs> right, like I'm sure this all took you an hour or something, right? Right. Um, so you have to, like, there's a, a cost-benefit analysis where the benefits are going to someone else and the costs are going to you. Um, and then there's that last part where you say this will take time to do because it requires developing a new part of the website code. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yep, yep, yep. But it was a good response. Um, uh, so I'm sure you've all heard of Internet Rule 34, which we're not going to go into here. But you may not have heard of Internet Rule 34.179, which is that if it exists, there is a Wikipedia page of it. Um, in this case, I'm not even going to go into the details of this. This is the most famous sort of blow up at this whole complexity of data rebroadcasting that has happened in recent, uh, I guess in the last year, which is the, um, the quote, right to be forgotten cases, which I believe Google was the original defendant or, or party at issue, but it, the laws that were passed applied to all companies that, that have search results. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, this was uh, the original case that finally made it before whatever European Union court or legislative you know, hearing body or something that made this change was a Spanish man who had been in bankruptcy and, or his home was in foreclosure. And this appeared in a public record and was like the second or third result for his name when you Googled his name, um, which doesn't look good. And also he had paid the debt off and not been foreclosed and the whole thing was done and like it wasn't really true anymore and it possibly wasn't ever really true in the way that the record said it was. So his good name was being besmirched and this was the first thing people saw when the search results came up. Um, so this, Google said, well, you know, the source is, 
the source is the problem. This is an erroneous or, or at least incomplete record on some Spanish government website. And if you fix it, we'll, we'll be sure to index it right away. And instead, the EU came back and said, nope, we've got to develop an entire system and like hire a whole new department to process these this request for this new right that we're going to declare, which is the right to be forgotten. And I don't know if you remember, like tech industry reaction at that time was not unanimously, but very much like, oh, this is terrible. These these European bureaucrats, they don't understand the innovative Internet and how they're going to cripple us. And there was there was not a lot of sympathy for the idea that that maybe this this idea of a right to be forgotten uh, was actually a useful right to add in a time when the first thing people do when they want to know about you is go to a search engine. Um, so I just want to step back and say that we are not actually in an innovative time. These problems are, oh, you weren't raising your hand, were you? Yeah, but by the way, although that was a fake out, feel free to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Interrupt, it's totally fine. I'm just trying to keep um, you on your game. Yeah, I'm so not on my game. Um, I, I spent this weekend at a, a three-day tango festival with Houston right there. And we were dancing with like strangers till four in the morning, two nights in a row, and I'm so not on my And now the whole internet knows that. Everybody correct. I knew these jokes were gonna happen when I developed this talk, I just want you to know that. <laughs> so but like let's let's step back and sort of look at the history. That just because it happens on the internet and happens at sub millisecond speeds because switching networks and stuff are involved, that doesn't actually make a problem conceptually new. So we've had this problem for years, overturned convictions, expunged convictions. Um, and this was an issue even before, uh, you know, websites that list convicts or expunge IO and, and things that help you get your records expunged. Um, there's a, I believe, somebody who's a lawyer or knows this law can, can correct me if this is wrong, that, for example, if you're applying for a job and you were convicted of something and even served time for it in the past, but then you legally had that conviction thrown out or overturned some technical word for it, you're allowed to answer no to the question. Thank you. I see an attorney nodding his head. Thank you. <laughs> you are allowed to answer no on the job application form to the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Now, that sounds like a lie, right? But the law has basically decreed that there's a special zone of, of different truth here that applies, and as long as everyone who's evaluating that, the answer to that question knows that, and the people who are answering it know that, um, and they do, because believe me, their lawyer tells them, then, then we all know what it means. So the only difference between the past and now is that in the past, you would have had to go do serious research in the, in the you know, county courthouse or something to find out that that con conviction ever happened. Whereas now, it might be the first hit for someone's name, even though it's been totally thrown out, maybe they were found to be actually innocent, doesn't matter. It's the first thing you see. This, by the way, this isn't you know hypothetical. I was searching on the name, a name that I will not say because this is being broadcast, of another dancer at that uh, tango event last night. <laughs> the third hit is about is a an article about a woman who was uh, arrested for stealing thousands of dollars from this person, and there it was, and the, the Google snippet had all this stuff, right? And when I clicked through the article, because now I was curious, right, gossip about a pelvic dancer, I found out that the web, the newspaper website had that article. It did sell that. But up at the top, there was a link that said, this art, there is a follow-up to this article from later about how this, uh, this arrest was thrown out. And that was not visible in the Google snippet. So, like, just in, in the course of, like, the last 24 hours, honestly, before I even started preparing these slides, another example of this happened. Um, so it happens all the time. Uh, credit ratings, that's another one. It's like credit rating agencies are making statements about you based on source material that they get from commercial entities. And they're making those statements to parties with whom you are doing business. And if they make a mistake, including if they just pass on a mistake that they got from the original source material, you can be in big trouble. Uh, this happened to me. Citibank uh, mistakenly thought that I had defaulted on some credit card that I never had with them. I don't know where they got the information, but then I couldn't get a mortgage for months in New York City. Like, like it actually seriously affected my life. And it turned out that there was a whole process that Citibank legally had to obey that allowed me to wipe that from their record. So there was already a right to be forgotten, you know, for credit rating agencies, and it just hadn't been applied to search engine companies. Um, so I just gave an example. 
you know, there's always been this problem of false, either false news reports that get a lot of circulation, you know, the error, error travels on, on uh, wings and truth is, has cement over shoes, um, something like that. Uh, or incomplete news reports is like, yeah, the news report is accurate, but there's some really important follow-up, like, you know, uh, yes, yes, that person did crash that car and, and, and kill that person's pet, but then later there's news report that they were having a heart attack while it happened, like it's not their fault, right? Um, so the internet just makes it easier for the, for whatever thing got the most attention to rise to the top. This is, I think the biggest thing that's changed, the thing that really is an innovation is that we have this new phenomenon where the, whatever the most linked to or gossip worthy, you know, thing, whatever gets the most Google juice, whatever algorithm your search engine is using, that is going to be the top result. And that's usually the most interesting or talked about result. It has nothing to do with whether it's the most up-to-date or correct or complete result. Um, so I think the, that the, the old ethic of like source material is God, we just reflect it, and it's not our job to, to clean that stuff up, it's not really tenable. Like you have to think about what this means for the people who, who are the targets, the subjects of these searches. And if you're running a server that rebroadcasts data, you, you unfortunately take on this, this moral responsibility to decide what your policy is going to be when people, when bad things happen to people because you're publishing rumors about them, essentially. Um, so what are some working principles? Well, so remember your biases. Uh, we in the tech industry, and sort of count everyone here as being in one way or another in that industry, we're binary. Like, data is either correct or it's not correct. And that means it's either available or it's not available. The fact that it might be easier to find over here or not over there is, that's kind of doesn't exist to us. It's like it's either on the net or it's not on the net. Um, other humans are not like that. They are. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what the? Who? Did somebody SSH from my box to something else? <laughs> it's a really um, unique problem from the experience. All right. I, I don't know what cron job I have running with like two even hacks during a presentation. Anyway, other people, you know you're doing it right when you manage to come naturally to a point in your presentation where it says other humans are fuzzy. <laughs> um, most people are not like us in the tech industry. The, the notion that information is either it's right or it's wrong or it's, it's available or not available, it's not such a binary distinction for them, I don't think. For, for most people, there's this continuum of, of like, how easy is it to find? How likely is a social acquaintance of mine likely to stumble across it? It's a matter of probabilities and, and sort of emotion and perceived harm. And it's a technical answer of like, the source data you know, was wrong and, and you, you know, fix it at the root and it will just broadcast through the system within, within a month or something. That's not, that doesn't really help. Um, so, some principles to use in uh, in developing your own policy if you're running a service that broadcasts data about people. Um, first, remember your biases and try to think about how it feels to your users and to other people. You know, your users is the wrong word because these aren't necessarily users. There's people that your system is broadcasting rumors about. So, imagine how it feels to them. Um, ask yourself: Is the information there? through a voluntary and knowing action that the subject themselves took. That's why I felt that Stephen was being very generous to that first complaint, the person who went before a council to make an excessive water rate complaint and then it was in the notes. Well, I mean, you know, that person kind of made all of that happen and they weren't claiming that the information was incorrect. They just didn't want it on this website. Um, I think that when a person has taken actions that they knew would lead to stuff being public, that there, you have more of a right to broadcast it down. I'm not saying that totally decides the question, and you'll probably have complexities come up even with that, but that's, that's a good thing to start from. Um, is there likely to be follow-up information that is relevant? And if so, are you going to find it and make it available? Is your scraper going to get all the sources where follow-up information is? So Google failed this test. It has the headline from years ago in that small town newspaper that says that the woman was arrested for stealing you know, gazillions of dollars. Uh, but even though the website there has, the newspaper website has the follow-up thing right at the top of the article, Google did not come by and catch that and put it in its snippet. So it's failing the follow-up test. 
Um, and uh, very important, is there some traditional official forgetting process involved in it? So overturned or, or expunged convictions is the classic example. If there is a legal or even just a traditional convention that this is the sort of thing which people expect to be forgotten under certain circumstances, you should make sure that your server is obeying that convention as well as whether or not the original source is. Um, that's, you know, I think those those social traditions are very hard won. They are evolved over time, and to just throw them out because you have new technology is probably usually a mistake, I think. And then the last thing is just if you're dealing with things on a case by case basis, just ask yourself how you would feel. I almost put you, but then I thought, how would you feel if it were your kid? Because this is a situation where, like, we all feel like we can handle our online reputation and identity. We sort of know how the web works. You know, we know how to get our friends to all link to something to make something else not be the first hit anymore. Right? We've all done, yeah, we've all done that. <laughs> um, but what about a relatively helpless party? Like, your kid is the target of a Google bomb bullying attack at school, right? Where now anyone who searches for your kid gets some mocking thing as the first hit. Or there's some incorrect record and, and your kid doesn't know how to navigate the wrong websites and your parents aren't helping them. Um, like the, the, those names in your databases are real people. I, I do not think that the, the EU made necessarily a mistake. I, there could be implementation details that are, that are unwise, but I don't think fundamentally that this right to be forgotten thing that you did is a mistake. I think that it is an acknowledgement of the new reality that we have very irresponsible information scrapers and broadcasters right now, and that the, there's going to be a period of readjustment while they start to learn the social norms that we had up until the invention of the internet.